Doro, lead author of the abstract titled Persistent Efficacy of Dextromethorophan Quinidine for Pseudobulbar Affect, results from a 12-week open-label extension study. This abstract is embargoed until 3 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday, April 13, 2010. Welcome, Dr. Pioro. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that you've all received a copy of the um, uh, slides in a way, uh, just for your reference, that you can follow along. I'll be keeping to those mostly, but I'll give you some overview um, of what we did. I'm, I'm only the first author of, of several authors on this uh, work, and it, it's actually an international study um, taking place in uh, the United States as well as South America. So there are many people involved in, uh, in doing this study without whom uh, we could not have come to, to this conclusion. And I'd like to give you a, a kind of one portion of, of the findings. This is really talking about our um, results from the open label extension trial, uh, which was preceded by a double blind placebo controlled trial. So what we'll be focusing on in my presentation uh, is the 12 week open label extension trial, which followed the double blind uh, 12 week trial. And really the objective of this um, portion, this open uh, label trial, was to further establish the efficacy, but, but primarily the safety, the long-term safety of the combination uh, therapy of dextromethorphan, which I'll be referring to as DM, uh, at two doses, um, at least in the double-blind phase, we used 30 milligrams and 20 milligrams dextromethorphan, two different groups, with, in combination with quinidine, or abbreviated Q, uh, at a 10 milligram level. So in this open label extension phase, there was really only one dose level that was given to patients that had initially been distributed to three different groups, either the 30 milligram either, or the 20 milligram dextromethorphan or placebo. So everyone in the open label extension phase was getting 30 milligram, 20 milligram um, drug, just to clarify that in that initial objective, so it's one, one dose. I'd like to give you a little background about what is pseudobulbar affect, or PBA, as I'll be referring to it um, in the presentation. Pseudobulbar affect is a, an involuntary um, expression of motions, which, which really is an explosive um, uh, release. It's a sudden and um, involuntary, as I mentioned, frequent uh, outbursts of, uh, of emotions, primarily laughter or giggling. Uh, crying or just getting teary-eyed, so variability and in intensity, or sometimes irritability and anger can be part of pseudobulbar affect as well. So it's a combination. It could be any one of these that could occur in any one individual, uh, but very often uh, one individual may have predominantly laughter or predominantly crying or predominantly irritability and anger. What we were capturing in this study is primarily the laughing and the crying episodes. So this is in the context of underlying neurologic disease or injury. Uh, various conditions uh, where one can see this include multiple sclerosis and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but they are by far not, not the um, only conditions where one can see PBA, and we can talk more about that later. But the study was primarily looking at individuals with MS and ALS. These episodes are very exaggerated and they are often incongruent or not consistent with what the individual may be feeling inside. So their mood may be totally different from their expression of this sudden uh, emotion of, of in this PBA context. And it also may be inappropriate for the setting where they find themselves in the environment. For example, um, some patients who, who I've followed uh, may have been at a funeral and instead of crying or being sad, will suddenly start giggling or laughing. So one can imagine how socially paralyzing and incapacitating this, this condition can be. And that, is, that can be a, a real significant problem, causing individuals to become withdrawn and socially isolated, in addition to whatever it is that they may be uh, experiencing with their neurologic disease that, that uh, causes this problem in the first place. Um, there have been previous uh, studies that have been done, um, double-blind uh, controlled studies, with higher dosing of quinidine, specifically 30 milligram of quinidine, but um, the same 30 milligram of dextromethorphan that have been done in the past and have shown that there is efficacy uh, with this uh, higher dosing of, of quinidine. So 
the purpose of these, these trials and, and the one that I'm presenting then was really to, to test whether the 30 milligram dextromethorphan or 20 milligram dextromethorphan in the context with 10 milligram or much lower dosing of quinidine would be equally effective. The study design for this um, uh, open label extension was a 12 week uh, long study. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it uh, followed the double blind phase uh, of patients that uh, either suffered from multiple sclerosis or ALS. Those that completed the 12 week long double blind study then uh, and had been sort of um, assigned to either of the three groups of 30 milligram dextromethorphan, 20 milligram dextromethorphan, both with with the 10 milligram quinidine or placebo, so those three groups could then be eligible if they completed that double blind study. Uh, they would roll over then into the open label uh, trial. And this would be done within a two week period. So some patients were rolled over the same day, but a lot of patients, about 50% or so, uh, had a delay of up to two weeks between the time of finishing the double blind trial and starting the open label extension trial. And then all of the individuals would be receiving 30 milligrams dextromethorphan, 10 milligrams of quinidine. If you look at the um, um, figure one, which shows you the breakdown, it, it becomes quite easy to see how these three groups then uh, were broken down. And we started off with um, uh, randomizing 326 patients uh, in equal proportions, uh, fortunately, uh, into each of these three arms for the double blind phase, which lasted 12 weeks. The broken vertical lines indicate the visit dates, or the visit times, uh, when various um, testing was, was performed and data was acquired. At the end of that um, period of time, those patients that completed the double blind phase then, and you'll see the numbers for each of the uh, respective groups, <clears throat> were eligible to then roll over into the open label phase. And you can see that uh, there were 253 patients then that uh, were enrolled in the open label extension with um, a 12-week period of observation uh, at those weeks that are, that are indicated with the broken vertical line. So that kind of gives you an, a bird's eye view of, of, of the design. And we're really focusing right now on the right-hand side of that figure one, which is this open label phase. But also keep in mind that there is that period of time of up to two weeks in between the end of the double blind and the beginning of the open label that, that are important to, to keep in mind when it comes to looking at the efficacy that we were identifying uh, with our measures. And I'll get to that in, in, in just a moment, but the next uh, page shows you the, the breakdown, the demographics in table one of the, the patients that were enrolled. And, and again, we're focusing on the open label phase, which is the far right-hand side, far right-hand column. But you'll see to the left, in the double blind trial, the three different groups, and really how similar uh, the demographics are um, of, of the patients that made up the open label extension with the uh, preceding double blind trial. So um, you can see that there were 253 patients enrolled in the open label extension, uh, the mean age being 52. There were slightly more females um, uh, than males in, in, in the trial. Um, preponderance of um, uh, Caucasians. Uh, there were 17% um, Hispanics, and in large part because of the um, participation of uh, South American sites, uh, particularly Argentina and Brazil. Uh, the underlying disorder that made up the majority of patients was ALS, uh, about 